Um, so when I was asked to give this talk, uh, I was asked to do this as a pre-digitization curation talk. And one of the things, of course, I found out by the way is that trying to define pre-digitization curation and apply it to the different fluid collections uh, consistently at UF is a difficult thing to do. So I'm just going to talk in broad terms about digitization and curation and how for three different collections at UF these things occur at different times and the reasons for that. And maybe at the end we'll talk a little bit about um, how these workflows can be improved, how these things can potentially be more efficient. This isn't a, uh, a talk that says this is the right way to do it. This is a talk that says I want to talk to the people at the Florida Museum of Natural History, my peers, with alcohol collections, and found out what they were doing. And now we want to see what you all think of it. So the uh, three groups of organisms are fishes, which I'm sure all of you learned in grade school is the dominant form of vertebrate life on the planet. Um, <laughs> perps, which you probably also learned at that time are nutritious prey for fishes. <laughs> uh, and inverts, which uh, are both crunchy and nutritious prey <laughs> for fishes, and also make great habitat and a place to put your eggs. <laughs> so, um, getting more serious, what, what types of digitization do these collections conduct? Well, it seems to me what we've all talked about for digitization here is very basic. It's databasing, it's georeferencing, and it's specimen imaging. And lo and behold, that's what these collections do. Um, consistently, each collection uses a Microsoft Access database, although we are soon to be clients of Andy Bentley's and Specify. Um, we use that to track our specimen and locality information, as well as our loans and so forth. Um, for georeferencing, these, uh, these groups use geolocate and Google Earth to determine the locality coordinates, and usually ArcGIS um, to put points on maps for publication. And the collections do specimen imaging with various uh, SLR cameras, or containers of types you've seen, and you'll see again here in some various backdrops. So this gets more to the question that Gil asked me, which is, you know, when does this digitization happen? And I'm familiar with processing fishes um, after having worked there for quite some time, but wasn't so familiar with uh, perps and inverts, and so I went to talk to those folks, and what I found out is for fishes, it happens uh, mostly after curation. Again, knew that already. Um, for herps, it happens, again, we're talking about you know, photography, databasing, and uh, georeferencing, a fair bit before and after curation. And then for inverts, it happens mostly before and during curation, which is markedly different from fishes and herps. And as I go through this talk, um, you'll see that I'm going to be comparing fishes and herps together at first. You think of them as one clay. And then we're going to be talking about inverts um, afterwards because inverts are different from, are more different from fishes and herps, neither one of each other. And then again, we might talk a little bit at the end about what improvements can be made to these processes. Okay, so we'll go through uh, fishes in a little bit of detail. It's a seven step process. Collect specimens, locality information, take DNA subsamples from those specimens, uh, anesthetize, fix the specimens in formalin preserve them for the long-term in alcohol, um, put the locality information in their database, sort and identify collections, catalog lots, label lots, shell lots, and we'll just look at some pictures of these activities here. So here is uh, specimens being collected in the field in Sumatra. I think Andre Lopez is on the deep end of that same with me. And, uh, some of Larry Page's students may recognize his distinctive head man. Uh, DNA subsampling. This is a real pain. Um, I was talking with some folks earlier this morning, Gabby Hogue in particular, I would really like a better and more efficient technique because this is a very low and curly type exercise this sometimes. <laughs> in the field, um, you've got four people in this uh, picture here involved in taking little snips of tissues from anesthetized fishes along the banks of a river, a very <coughs> hot, humid uh, day in the field. You've got anesthetized specimen selection. You have the specimens being handed to Andres, who's taking the tissue samples with scissors from a sometimes still wriggling fish if the anesthesia didn't take full effect. And you've got tissue record keeping, and of course the vials going back into the uh, container. They've been anesthetized, Andy, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this is collecting of specimens after the, uh, the tissue sampling. Here we've got 
Susie Gardy, one of the better collection workers we ever had, with a beautiful little uh, diadem and popper. And then there's going into the uh, finesse, uh, into the MS-222, and eventually into the formaldehyde, so that's special collecting. We get back to the lab from the field. This is obviously a fairly dated photo. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are laughing because of the computer monitor, I'm laughing because my friend doesn't have as much hair anymore. Show me how friend said that. So, uh, this is our Microsoft Access database. But we, the point is, we put our locality information using uh, field numbers as the anchor for those, all those collections into the database, almost first and foremost every time. And then we go to the lab to sort and identify specimens using all the available literature. Uh, and then we arrive at the stage of cataloging specimens labeling and shelving them, and if anybody works in wet collections, or even any kind of collection, we actually have to go ahead and put things into a phylogenetic system and file them in the right place. This is very labor intensive. Uh, before any labels can be printed, there has to be a data entry and data proofing. Um, Andy spoke pre uh, previously about being able to uh, proof your data before appending it to the main database and specify it. I was glad to hear that, because that's the process we use and we enjoy. Um, so we do the data proofing. Once the data has been proofed and appended to the main database, you can produce your labels. And you can print, uh, you print your labels and then take them to the, the lab, match the specimens, insert the labels in the containers, and then of course the shelving according to the lab and the system. So off you go into the uh, enormous uh, collection of over 210,000 jars on shelves. And then uh, the final thing is those uh, the tissue vials again, so now you've got them back in the lab. And we've got to make sure that what we called something in the field, of course, is now what we called it in the lab. And it's, if it's not, we make sure we're matching things up correctly before we send the vials to a uh, centralized deep freeze, much like they have here at KU, and uh, the associated data to the uh, staff of that centralized deep freeze, which we call the Genetic Resources Repository. So for each one of these collections, uh, fishes, perps, and invertebrates, I thought it was interesting to poll the collection managers and ask them how they're currently getting specimens, uh, in particular specimens that they're cataloging these days. And by currently, I said, in last year, what's the breakdown? Well, so I asked myself, this is it for fishes. 55% uh, of new accessions are collected by division staff, and you just saw the process for that. They arrive in the lab in formalin. 35% of new accessions are from outside sources, agency partners, and they have like, the USGS that we partner with in Gainesville, uh, their biological resources division that is. And they typically arrive form and fixed and better yet in alcohol, 70% ethanol, that's terrific. And 10% of new accessions of late is being pulled from the backlog, things that have been around 40, 50 years, to be cherry picking, identify, and feel really good about pulling out of the backlog and making them available for research. And if, of course, it's been formal and fixed, and it's usually an alcohol, but then alcohol, alcohol typically has to change. That's fishes. So now we're heading a little further afield from my area of expertise, but I think I can give a fair representation of what herps do. And for herps, they use a priority system, and the specimens that are not priority get tagged with a catalog number immediately upon receipt and are placed in the freezer. This is their curation process. I didn't go over a, a field protocol for them because a lot of what they get is not being collected by them these days. It's stuff being brought in by the public or by agency partners. But suffice it to say, if they do go out and collect specimens, many times they also bring them back uh, recently dead or frozen as they uh, receive them from their agency partners. <coughs> so things in bold and underlined are departures from what we would do with fishes. They measure snout bent length and total length of every specimen. They weigh every specimen, they sex every specimen. Uh, they then take the tissue sample, and then they tag with a catalog number. We don't assign the catalog number until one of the last steps in the process, as you recall. So at this point, the specimen has a catalog number, and it's not yet in the database. So our specimens get catalog numbers upon being database. And of course, as many as you know, perps tend to catalog every specimen versus doing it on a lot basis of the human. So sometimes they take digital photos. 
uh, treat specimens with 10% formaldehyde and place them in a fixing container and if it's a tadpole, you can end the process right here. They keep them in formaldehyde for the long term. Step number eight is entering the data in the database. At this point now, they're taking that catalog number on the specimen that they just pulled out of the freezer and entering it into the database and compiling all the locality information. Uh, they remove and rinse with water after a week or so in formalin, depending upon the specimen size. Of course, many of you are familiar with injecting specimens with formalin if they're large. And then they place them into 70% ethanol and shell. This is how perps arrive at UF according to the collection manager. 94% of the new accessions were brought in frozen or recently dead. 3% arrive in alcohol with no exposure to formalin, thus can be typically uh, tissue sampled. 2% fixed in formalin, preserved in alcohol. You'll recall this is more or less the predominant way in which we get fishes. And 1% comes in formalin, and every so often you find a and introduced a guana lurking on the shelf. Packed <laughs> her, so I'm going to steal that thing from her one of these days. <laughs> State that publicly. Any of this go, much manager has been more. So, again, I told you I would compare fish and herps more closely to one another than I would either to uh, inverts. Inverts is going to be a standalone. So, you've seen the process now for fish and herps. Um, what about the digitization methods that are being used other than databasing? So this is us, fish people, uh, photographing the white shark in 1998 using the available material to us. I'd like to say that in 2013 we would use a different method, but I know that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> However, we would not be caught dead wearing shorts like this, collecting uh, <laughs> specimens uh, at sea. But this is, as you know, how uh, fishes often were photographed in the pre-digital age. And that's George Burgess for folks. So what we do these days when we take pictures of fish is typically uh, shoot them in a photo tank in the back of the fish division. And so we're talking about these legacy specimens, right, or a recently collected and preserved specimen. There's Zach Randall operating our uh, photo tank with uh, Bob Quinn, our volunteer. So Mark alluded to this a little bit in his talk, and uh, being a photo novice, um, in fact, I have very little to do with the photos coming forward in the talk. Zach Brantley did most of them. Um, I thought it would be interesting as we talk about pre digitization curation or when should we do things like taking photos to compare a recently collected specimen that was photographed in the field with it in preservation. So here you have this little uh, carangid, the cereal is an axonata type of jack, and the uh, upper photo is the specimen shortly after collection and having been anesthetized and fixed in full one. And within hours, and there's the same fish, still a very nice specimen. Uh, some two years later, we just photographed it uh, more or less last week. Uh, but you can see information's been lost. And the question is, can you live with that loss of information? Um, that's what we're here to try to decide. And this is your typical kind of straw brown fish that's been in alcohol for a long time and that's been pulled out and gussied up for a publication and um, photographed to the best of our ability. Again, nice photo by Zach dealing with the specimen that he had. But this specimen also had pretty nice contrast in life and had some color despite the fact that it's a steel. Yes, they do, in fact, have some character and charisma to them in their life. And in herps, there's a difference. A lot of their specimens are photographed alive. For one thing, they don't need squeeze tanks. They don't have to keep them in water. They photograph the subjects oftentimes in the field before they're collected. Now, this is an indigo snake. It was not collected. But, uh, and they're also known to be quite docile. Here's one where Kenny Crisco, the collection man, would sleep as he attempts to take photos. And here are specimens that are in the collection, uh, at least the big echo that was introduced to uh, South Florida to the Florida Keys has been captured and is waiting a catalog number. And this uh, spade with toad uh, is just a photographic voucher. Herbs does a lot with photographic vouchers. So uh, oftentimes you're dealing with either protected species or animals that are already well represented in the collection that they don't want to, uh, to kill. Sometimes where people can be soft on that sort of stuff. I understand, herbs are great. Um, but here we went ahead and made that same comparison that you saw with the fish. To give an idea again of what might be lost if you 
don't take a photograph in the field, whatever kinds of things, uh, they're no longer available to the to the research scientists. And Mark, I'm going to send you that little notice so you can get all those bubbles out for me. <laughs> So both fishes and herbs do georeferencing. I'm not going to say a lot about it. Um, we've been working on a project to uh, kind of like uh, Adam, what Adam Cohen talked about, but not as extensive as the work they've done in the state of Texas, but we're trying to produce an atlas of the distribution of inland fishes of Florida. And this represents our effort to date. And this is uh, through the use of uh, geolocate primarily and then ArcGIS. Uh, herbs has been more extensive still, although I would point out that they're using bigger dots here to make it look like yeah. they've done more. <laughs> but they, they have, in fact, georeferenced their whole collection, not just what they have for the state of Florida. And using the same sort of approach, uh, geolocate, Google Earth, um, pretty much uh, they'll use whatever's available to them. Inverts. All right. You see little soldiers from fighting the inverts? <laughs> uh, I just thought that was pretty good. There's a whole series of these photographs online, which are just <laughs> okay, so this is the point at which uh, I'm going to probably just read from these slides and uh, editorialize a little less. Uh, suffice it to say, the process differs substantially from what you've seen for fish and herbs. A lot of digitization is front-loaded. It's done in the field, and there's a variety of reasons for this. Uh, they take so many photographs, hundreds of thousands within the last 10 years, according to one of the uh, technicians in the Invertebrate Zoology Division, that they uh, include a rank system. And the reason they're taking all these photos in the field, as invert people know, uh, is that certain morphological characters in these invertebrates can oftentimes only be seen while the specimens are alive, and these are important characteristics for identification. And so you've got to get the photographs when animals are alive or after they've just been recently anesthetized. And so they have a very uh, assembly line type production that you'll see they use in the field. So nothing they do that's different from fish and herbs is they assign numbers to specimens while in the field. They call these field numbers, which is confusing, I think, to some fish people because we assign field numbers to a collection of events and a number of specimens from a particular place in time and not to any one of those given specimens. But they assign field numbers as specimen numbers in the field. This is the process stepwise. So the collection locality is the station number not to be confused with the field number. Uh, they do specimen sorting to morpho species. They need to know right away what they're dealing with because they need to start capturing information through digitization. And the field number is assigned to the specimens. <coughs> they produce two copies of that field number. The field number is reported to a master spreadsheet. And what's going to happen to that specimen is determined at this stage, whether it's going to be photographed, subsample, voucher, and how it is to be fixed, including the uh, anesthetization or relaxation procedures, is all determined and reported on that spreadsheet during step three. So those two field numbers, two copies of the same field number, which now go with this specimen here, this uh, terabellum worm, um, are included in the photograph. And of course, this specimen can be photographed while alive, or it can be photographed after it's been relaxed, depending upon what kind of characteristics they're trying to get it to show and how they're trying to get to cooperate. Uh, after this uh, photography and anesthesia and relaxation is completed, the specimen will be subsampled for DNA if they decide to do that. And one copy of that field number will then go into the DNA tube. One copy of the field number will go with the specimen on its way to fix it. And so they're linked in that way. This is uh, that process underway uh, in the laboratory in the field. Uh, there, this is Mandy Venus relaxing specimens in anesthetic baths, taking tissue samples, that's what she's up to right there, and then fixing the specimens in formaldehyde. This is bulk sampling and sorting. So they get all these creatures back from the field, take it to the lab. The lab may be on the shore, the lab may be in the boat and specimens are being sorted out into these trays and they're prioritizing, deciding which ones are going to be photographed, and therefore that need to be relaxed, 
which can just be anesthetized and um, bulk samples and put in form one and delta when they get back to the field, and that's more like what you're seeing here. <coughs> so those field sheets that I mentioned can be handwritten, and if they are, they typically take photographs of them in the field to back them up. Um, if they are entered directly into a spreadsheet, then they just make another copy and save it to the external hard drive. The uh, field sheet data in the spreadsheet is recorded again, like I said, in the lab. I'm uh, oh, sorry, um, recorded in the field, but it can also be recorded in the lab, pending. And when they return to the lab, the spreadsheet is taken to their database, imported, and then catalog numbers now are assigned to each of those specimens, <coughs> and those catalog numbers are linked to the field numbers. The uh, DNA tubes, which still have only a field number in them, must then be matched to the catalog number. So they find the DNA tubes with the same field number as what they have in their spreadsheet, look at what the catalog number is that was just assigned in the lab, it's also on that spreadsheet, write the catalog number on a piece of paper, and put it in the tissue lab. You guys heard me talk about how cumbersome I found tissue sampling in the field to be, I think this might be more cumbersome still. So I'm, not, I'm happy that I'm not doing this particular process. Um, but there's reasons for it, and I, I'm not uh, meaning to be flipped. They, 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 this process works for them. So number 12, all the photographs that they took in the field are then renamed. So you have your, your file name from the, the camera, and they rename them in much the same way as what Laura described, using uh, geographical information to group the uh, photographs that they've taken over the last 10 or so years doing field work all throughout uh, the Indo-Pacific and in the, uh, the Western Atlantic. And then those bulk specimens that I showed you uh, will then be worked up in the lab. And of course, there's no need to ever assign a field number to them since they only get treated in the lab. And typically, photos aren't taken because they've been fixed in formaldehyde and maybe even shifted over to alcohol and they're not going to be suitable for that and clearly going to be any tissue samples. This is another type of bulk sampling that they do called mass sampling, where you end up taking this rubble, smashing it, and looking for cool little things that might be hiding therein. And then to show you their uh, example from their specimens, photographed in the field, relaxed, and then preserved in ethanol, and you can see it some five years after the fact. Again, some sort of information is lost. How did the inverts arrive at UF? Sort of complete the cycle here, equal treatment for each group. 90% uh, or more are being collected by division staff and processed in the field in the way I just described when they arrive in Form 1 for alcohol. 10% or so of new accessions are pulled from the backlog or uh, received from partial scientists. Their Form 1 fixed and or in alcohol when they receive them. I didn't talk to you about georeferencing. For these folks, I mean, big surprise, they're doing most of this modern field work right now in the time in which we have GPS devices, but they do also have large amounts of orphan collections that they're going to be dealing with in the coming years and will probably become a client of uh, Nelson's for geolocating, georeferencing all of those specimens, those legacy specimens. So, what can we conclude from these comparisons? Probably a lot more than what I have on the slide, but I'll just run these four things. Fluid collections of fish, herps, and inverts, digitized specimen information using similar methods for remarkably different processes, at least at the University of Florida's Museum of Natural History. Specimens are in the best condition for photography prior to preservation. No surprise there. Uh, conditions for photography are not always ideal prior to preservation, and this is the trade-off that we all struggle with. Um, except for Mark, he really knows what he's going to do, and I respect that. <laughs> <laughs> the photographs are, are fantastic, and it's through the images often that we convince the public that the organisms we study are, are worth worthy of study. Uh, and conducting digitization of the field prior to or concurrent with curation comes with trade-offs. That's not an ambiguous note to end on. I don't know what is, but I will end on it all the same. Thank you.